welcome to the PC Gaming Week Spot. Your recap of the last seven days in PC video gaming. My name is Colin Mahern and joining me this week. Can you believe it? We've been spending, he's been spending even, I'm not meant to read the actual quote. Uh, he's been spending the last three weeks trying to work out how to be a live human again. It's the one and only Mr. Matthew Castle. Hello. Hi, Matthew. How are you? Uh, uh, good, thank you. Uh, any, any guesses on uh, what, what cultural reference that could be? It's a toffee. I won't lie, it's a toffee. Been learning what it is to be human again. Well, you had been learning. I mean, the actual quote is, can you believe it? We've been spending the last three weeks trying to work out how to be a live band again because that quote is from a man called Rue Reynolds, who is the frontman of Enter Shikari, who are a... Why would I know that? Who are a rock and roll group... Uh, and they played Download Festival. Well, I thought you might know down- that, that Download happened this weekend. Oh, I know Pure- that Download purely, happened. Yeah, purely because it is one of the government's pilot live events, or whatever they're calling it, uh, which is Sacrificial where... Sacrificial lambs. Indeed. Uh, so yeah, there was 10,000 people at it, rather than the usual 100,000, but it was 10,000 people who could just just walk about the place, no mask and whatever else and the government is just just trying it out and seeing whether people die or not fingers crossed they won't um yeah that would be bad that would be bad we will i mean we will see uh but yeah i mean i do are you feeling brave enough at this point to go to public events yet do you think like would you i've I've been to the theater a few times oh i'd i'd be i don't know I'd, i'd feel cautious but you know. Oh, they've they've got they've got good social distancing. Everyone wears a mask during it. There's lots of check. You know, the 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 gap around you is is pretty big. Also, you know, the people going to those events, is, you know, are relatively more. They're grown up, sensible people. Like there's there's things I see where I'm like, I would not go into that place because yeah. I can just see the pe the 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 people in there. I just, if I'm going to get it from anyone, I'll get, you know, you can just tell. Some people have just got a bit of a covid vibe, mm, you know? Mm, indeed. Like I, I wouldn't go to a beach. Right. Even though it's outdoors. Yeah, because there's all the indoor, but, you know, I wouldn't get an ice cream inside at a beach. Mm. <laughs> Fingers crossed you'd be able to get an ice cream inside in the months to come. You know, I just buy can... ice cream and eat it at home. That's true. That is true. Um, <laughs> so, uh, well, you know what? Seeing as we're talking about things that we eat and we digest, Matthew, could thank you. Could you grab your uh, news crank for me and open that gob of yours? Because I have some information snacks for you. Nom, 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 Info nom, snacks nom, nom, for nom, his gob. <laughs> Opened really wide there. Good man. Um, because I do have some information snacks. This is oh. the E3 Fallout episode. God, is it, I can't believe that was only a week ago. I know. It feels like, like we've been digesting E3 news for months. It yes. does. It does indeed. Uh, but one of the big games at E3, of course, was Starfield. Although it, it did, I don't know, it did feel like uh, it sort of came and went, didn't it? it was, there wasn't as much of a Ferrari around it as potentially Xbox and Bethesda were anticipating. But regardless, um, after it, Todd Howard spoke to The Telegraph. And he he didn't really shed an awful lot of light on it. I suppose, you know, we spoke about it last week and how it was just a CG trailer. We didn't get much gameplay or anything. But he said, or he referred to Starfield as a, quote, more a hardcore RPG than their previous games, Fallout and Skyrim. Uh, he went on to say, it's got some really great character systems, choosing your background, things like that. We're going back to some things that we used to do in games long ago that we felt have really let players express uh, the character they want to be. So I think when I when you see it being played, you would recognise it as something we made. Does that... Mm. Do, you, what, do you take that as, like, rather than, yeah, a Fallout 4 or a Fallout New Vegas even, Fallout 
Are, are, are they saying like we're we're going way back? We're going CRPG here. Mm, I don't know. I don't really know what he means by that necessarily. I mean, a character having a background that impacts how they are perceived in a world mm. is pretty standard fare. Um, I mean, yeah, isn't that Skyrim was had yeah. that, didn't it? Like, maybe uh, that's what he's talking about. I mean, that is 10 years ago. Maybe we're going all the way back <laughs> 10 years. I suppose Skyrim is, too. yeah, fair, fair. I just hope it's, the problem I have with those systems is, is when you oversell it. Because I think that's the trap Cyberpunk fell into. You mm. know, it had like the three life paths and yep. it basically meant that after your bespoke prologue, you'd then have a 40-hour RPG where you maybe met one guy who was like, hey, didn't you used to resell in the desert? And you'd be like, wow, this is so reactive. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so maybe. I mean, I think I feel like everyone's learned their lesson from Cyberpunk. Yeah. It's like, big up your game, of course, advertise it, but just. I thought you know. he said, I thought that was a quote doing the round, so it was going to be like Han Solo. That was another. There was a there was a lot of non-committal, just I don't know, kind of marketing spiel. Yes, there was one about Han. I don't know, it's some sort of Han Solo like, simulator. Well, that's the thing. But then this whole. You get to choose your background as long as your background is Han Solo. <laughs> mm, yeah. Mm. I mean, I don't know. It, it'll probably show up as... When, I suppose, when is the next time they could show it? Next year's E3? Yeah, next year's I E3. Know. I think the, the problem with that Starfield reveal is, like, we already knew it was coming. You know, they'd already done, like, a logo reveal, mm -hmm. like, the year before. Um... And so by not showing it again, the sort of, sort of almost re-announcing it, it feels yeah. maybe less spicy. Uh, indeed, indeed. Uh, something that was pretty spicy, a lot of people enjoyed, the, uh, the Microsoft E3 showcase thing from last Sunday last. Uh, but they had an extra showcase thing on Thursday just passed. Uh, and this was essentially... Uh, deeper dives into a lot of the games that they showed off at their big hour and a half thing. Um, but there were a few games as well that didn't show up during their presentation. One of those, uh, and yeah, one of those games was Senua's Saga Hellblade 2. Mm. And it does sound like this game is very much in the early stages of development because Ninja Theories, Tamim Antoniades... Apologies if I've butchered that. Uh, but he, he said that the developer is currently, quote, building a good chunky slice of the game before we move, before we then move into full production to build out the rest. So this sounds quite a ways away. Uh, after we first saw it uh, back, uh, was it July 2020? I think was the first time we saw it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, quotes like that. Yeah. Do I, I wouldn't expect the Hellblade, Hellblade sequel for, for a while, at least. Mm. Um, it's an interesting one, because it, it, it had a, not a troubled, but quite a long journey mm -hmm. um, to release last time. Because I can remember, uh, not, maybe not, not like epically long, but I, I remember them coming in and showing quite an early version of that when I was back on Games Magazines, the first Hellblade. And it was quite different to how it eventually ended up you right. know and it felt like quite a small team i wonder as well like if with the the might of xbox behind it there's a <clears throat> desire for it to be grander in its ambitions in some way because the original is like relatively kind of like oh yeah focused i'd say yeah um, no, it is yeah maybe they're trying to grow it out into something a bit more substantial it's interesting Perhaps, perhaps. Uh, speaking about growing things out, sort of. Um, during Capcom's E3 thing, half an hour thing, mainly focused on games that are coming out soon rather than games that are out in the a couple of months' time or years' to, uh, years time, uh, they did announce, however, that they have begun work on Resident Evil Village DLC. Now, mm -hmm. without spoiling... The end of Resident Evil Village, I suppose. Um, what do you foresee, or what, or what would even what would you like this DLC to be? Because, like, do you think that 
<laughs> the end of Resident Evil Village. We'll talk around it. Uh, do you think that this DLC will follow that? Will it, will it be, do you think you're going to be in control of a different character? Or is this it's, just it, the tall yeah. vampire woman? It, it it felt it felt like to me that they were doing that the end of village sets up like a bigger sequel rather than this is a story that was going to be continued in DLC was mm. it felt like more of a hint of the future direction of the series rather than something we'll do immediately here yeah you could do you could do the villains thing um it, it, i was thinking of the um uh the evil within one had a quite a fun DLC where you played as like one of the boss characters, old box head. And it was like a first person thing where you went around like malleting people and you got to sort of experience the world from that perspective. Um, that could be interesting given that there is such like fan adoration for certain characters in that game. Um, what, one. <laughs> well, one. Yeah. You could do something like that. Um, I mean, like, a, a boring thing they could potentially do is uh, like what Chris Redfield is up to. Yeah. You know, follow his story through the game because your kind of paths kind of cross over a bit. Um, I mean, the problem is that you kind of, you know, you sort out most of the, most of the problems yourself as you go along. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, it's sort of, I don't know what that that story would, would, like would entail. What, that, that is true. What is Chris Redfield doing, really? Like, do you know <laughs> what? Like, Ethan is the one who's saving the world. Chris, I, I don't really know what... Chris, it feels like Chris is just playing catch-up. He's getting yeah. to these areas and going like, oh, it's already sorted, cool. I'll move on then. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, I mean, you know, the, I, I think the people like the DLC for seven mm-hmm. enough i think they did a few they did a couple of like like mini campaigns where you played as different characters wasn't there well there was one where you were chris yeah chris and there was one where you played as um it was like a uh wasn't it you were like another member of the baker family i don't remember that yeah that? i think there was one where you were and it was like it was a bit more like fisticuffs i think hmm. i can't We'll see, we'll see. But yeah, I, I, I would be intrigued by some Resident Evil Village DLC. Mm. See what they... Uh, but to be fair, like, you know, if you didn't see it, all it was was white text on a black oh, background. Te- that was like, just such, a un- like, such an underwhelming announcement. Like, <laughs> we are going, we announce our intention to make DLC for Resident Evil Village. You're like, wow, I'm glad I tuned in for this. <laughs> uh, Hero. One of my favourite games of this last year has been updated with Mm -hmm. uh, some pretty big features. Uh, So you can now save mid-run. There is also an option to speed up your progress around the map uh, and during the battles with enemies. And they've also added new cards and enemies as well. Uh, I haven't jumped into it since, but... That like the speed one is massive to me, even more so than the saving mid run. Although mm. that is that is nice, I suppose, um, because like if you don't know, once you start a a run in loop here, or you're committed basically. Uh, so this is um, this is a way to save your progress. It's good. And uh, what else do we have here? Speaking to Gamespot. Larian Studios have said that Baldur's Gate 3 won't be leaving Early Access in 2021. Founder Sven Vinke said, quote, We are really trying to get the game done by next year. It's, uh, it's not going to release this year for sure. When was the last time you jumped into Baldur's Gate 3, Matthew, or have you? Uh, I, have, I actually haven't, um, I haven't played it since they updated with the uh, Druid stuff. Um, Mainly because it kept resetting and I felt like I'd played like a loop of what had been in it a couple of times. Right. And I felt like I'd, I'd just sort of like step away from it a bit. And, you know, if, if it's needed for work, I'll play more of it. But otherwise, I'm kind of just You're waiting, happy to, to, waste. waiting mm. to enjoy it. Um, you know, I really like what's there. And I've, I've said before, I, you know, I really like what they're doing with it. And um, I don't really have... Uh, any problem with them with it being so different from the the, the original Baldur's Gate games? 
Um, I think they've been hit like super hard by uh, like COVID last year. Like they this has got like a lot of motion capture. It's like a lot more sort of cinematic game than than it was before. You know, in terms of you know the there's lots of you know performance capture for all the characters, and we're talking about hundreds of characters and you know all these mm. variations of it. And I think they've just had a you know basically kind of put a big pause on what they're doing. Um, I think they also, like, if you follow them on, like, social media and sort of just read their updates and things, they're, um, I think they're, they're bel- their offices in Belgium are always being, like, flooded. Their town is very floody. Oh, shit. <laughs> like, floods and power cuts and things. Like, they really, uh, they seem more cursed than other developers, but I kind of like that they sort of take it in their stride and seem to be quite good humoured about it. And their whole kind of it's ready when it's ready vibe is 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 quite healthy. Um mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll no, patient I'm... I'll patiently wait I'll wait for this. Uh agreed, agreed. I don't have it down here, but very quickly I did see as well Psychonauts 2 uh, there was yeah. a double fine quote going around recently about like we we have done this without crunching at all. Mm. Uh, so you know that looked I great. I, in in the extended Xbox demo last week, mm-hmm. that just looked so much fun. It did. Like, the variety of the levels and the invention of it and the execution of it just looks way way slicker than the first. I cannot wait for that game. I think that's mm-hmm. great. Big time. Uh, and finally, Epic Data Tracker, which is a website that keeps track of the Epic Game Store. Uh, nice. They noticed changes to two listings on the Epic Game Store that made reference to two unreleased games. One, Final Fantasy VII Remake, and two, Alan Wake Remastered. Ooh. Um, th- yeah, Final Fantasy VII's PlayStation exclusivity ended in April, and the Alan Wake thing, as far as I can remember, the Alan Wake thing that's been rumoured for a while is an Alan Wake sequel rather than an Alan Wake remaster. But Alan Wake is also... Alan Wake was 2010, was it? Like, that's... It's it's an old yeah. enough game. Like, I, I, yeah, if you made that look a bit shinier. Because uh, I, I think the narrative around Alan Wake has been one where it's like... It's, it's gained this sort of cult classic status. Mm. Uh, but then you have naysayers coming in from the side going, yeah, but it's not that great, is it? And I feel like Alan Wake does sit somewhere in the the middle of those, veering more towards cult classic, I, I would say personally, because I really enjoyed Alan Wake. Now, if you went back and played it, maybe it would feel a little clunky. Uh, and the ending is, I think I've even said before on here, the ending is fucking putrid. But... Uh, yeah, I, I, I do still really enjoy Alan Wake and I would love a remaster. And then if, you know, it's probably just testing the waters, seeing if, uh, if people buy that, then all right, we'll give you the Alan Wake 2 you want, you bastards. If you shut <laughs> up. That's exactly how they'll announce it too. Mm-hmm. I hope they do. It'll be good. Um, but yeah, either of those take your fancy, Matthew. Have you played the Final it, Fantasy VII Remake? I, I haven't. I, I was actually just about to stop playing it on PS5 because they've done the old update to mm. it um so i figured i'd play it there um yeah i mean if, if you're making an alan wake 2 uh it would make sense to have a you know a more up-to-date version or or a very accessible version for for everyone else um particularly with uh remedy doubling down on this sort of remedy expanded universe yeah. thing um you want all, you know, you want all the bits of, of that universe to be as sort of um, smooth and kind of current and sort of accessible as possible, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I replayed Alan Wake recently. It was, it's like still really good fun, oh, very sort of flashy. If anything, like it's such a sort of back then, it was a real like, you know, graphic showcase, very sort of show offy with all its fancy lighting and particle effects. And those are things that can only look like, even sexier if you jazz them up now. So, mm. yeah, I'll be uh, keen to see more. Mm, very good. Uh, so those are your information snacks. Some decent little morsels in there. Yeah, so my now, gob is satisfied. I'm <laughs> satisfied. Let's see if we can fit any more in. <laughs> Take it away, Hugh. 
I'm Hugh Edwards. Working in news is exciting. Yes! Headlines and hot takes <laughs> is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where we take you through some of the bigger news stories of the past week. And thank God we now have an Elden Ring correspondent on the show. So we throw it over to you, Matthew. Why am, uh, why am I an Elden Ring correspondent? Well, because you have showed some interest in the game more than I have. And oh, that's, geez. that's, uh, that's good enough for me. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's nothing major in the world of Elden Ring. That was all during E3, but there have been some little things trickling out, uh, since, mainly from Hidetaka Miyazaki, the director there of Elden Ring. So, yes, after the trailer was shown off during Jeff Keighley's big summer game festival, he did two interviews, one with Famitsu and one with IGN. And uh, it was just where he revealed a little bit more about the game. IGN asked him about the different combat in the previous games, the Souls, Sekiro and Bloodborne. And, you know, how, what will the, the, the combat be like in Elden Ring? He said, quote, We wanted to allow the player to combine these different elements from the other games to find their own strategy and even indirect approaches to combat if they wanted to. So yes, this is something that we wanted to explore more so than our previous games and really focus on. Uh, This level of variety and this level of freedom in combat. He also added that the stealth is going to be more simplistic than Sekiro's and that it will have a stamina bar the, the same one from Souls and Bloodborne. Uh, he said that that is going to be an Elden Ring, but he said it's going to be less restrictive than the older games. And then when he spoke to Famitsu, he, again, it was kind of the, the general feel of this was like, it's going to be a bit more forgiving uh, than their previous games. But he did say that they're not going to be adding an easy mode. So looking forward to that discourse. That's going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and actually, a follow-up to last week. We were talking about George R. R. Martin's involvement and wondering, what is that? What is his involvement? What's that going to be? So that has kind of since come out. Miyazaki touched on it with IGN. Uh, Martin did an interview with some local news channel when he was picking up an award at something. Um, but Miyazaki said that Martin's primary role was building out the world of Elden Ring and the overall plot and the character development of the bosses. And Miyazaki said that kind of because of this, Elden Ring is, quote, a lot easier to understand uh, than their previous games. Mm. So, Mr. Elden Ring, you know, uh, I'm- Lisa, I really, I, I, I think this is very unhealthy and it's, it sets me up for a huge fall. <laughs> it does. It's fine. It's you're you're looking forward to Elden Ring. That's that's all right. Ha, has have these quotes made you more excited? Like the fact that I think even last week you were talking about how you enjoyed kind of getting into the previous games, but then you would just get your arse handed to you so many times, like all of us that don't play the Souls games, uh, that you would just sort of lose interest and you'd move on. Have all of these, like you know. Uh, 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 these quotes about making it more accessible has that made it even more attractive to you since you've yeah, seen the trailer? Yeah, that's that, that, that's that's definitely what appeals. Um, you know, I like all the chat about the kind of the world structure as well, and the fact that you can kind of do it in an order of your choosing. And you know, it's nice to it's nice to know that in a game where I'm probably going to be butting up against a lot of like dead ends that you can just go off and butt up against a different dead end. I know, you know, it sounds like there's going to be like six regions. So it's like six places for you to go and like stall, you know, in the mm-hmm. game, which is better than just having one place to stall, which is what usually happens with me. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that kind of like, the, the thing I sort of bounced off in the past and kind of gives me sort of pause here is um, the whole like, like how much freedom you have to kind of create your character because in the past I found that, you know, I've nobbled myself from sort of step one by building a bad character. And in a right. way, like, it's, it's, the, it's a reason I, you know, of all his games, the one I've gelled with most was Sekiro, because it gives you like a fixed character. You don't have to make any decisions. This thing is built. It's been balanced for this particular experience. Um, obviously, I know the kind of freedom to build all your character and everything is hugely important um to 
to the the Souls games and is a big big part of the appeal. Um, so that kind of talk of like yeah, you know the more kind of open it is sort of interpretation, um, the bigger the risk is that I'll I'll just get stumped again. Um, that said, you know the option to have a, like a stealthier, albeit lighter than Sekiro uh, approach. Uh, that that appeals to me, and that's something I kind of liked about Sekiro. I felt like a kind of like sort of game the world a little a little easier mm. between the boss fights, which probably explains why I made more progress. Um, yeah, it's it's I, I, you know I'm still super intrigued by this one. You know, a lot of what he said, you know, feels like he's kind of relating it to his other games, which means less to me because I just haven't got very far through any yeah, of them. Yeah, so. Um, you know the 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 fact that they haven't come out and said you know yes this is this is you know accessible on a level that like if you like George R R Martin you know you're gonna you're gonna dig this too that 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 isn't the case and it sounds like his sort of you know involvement with it that yeah like you say finished quite a, quite a while back mm. um, yeah I mean. You just don't know this until you actually get your hands on it and go, you know, see like, oh yeah, I am going to be able to do this or not, and that's really what it will come down to. Um, I just don't really have the patience for these things, um, but for, that's on me. For 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 which things? Oh, I don't really have patience for the for you know, I don't have the sticking power rather to to kind of push through um, nice. the difficulty spikes of his previous games, even with the the critical plaudits piled on them. And the fact that loads of people I really respect say they're the best games ever, you know, even that reputation can't get me to just keep running into a brick wall again and again and again. Um, so the question is, yeah, will will we run into a brick wall here? Um, for a lot of people who are existing fans, that just won't be a problem. Like it's just a given that they'll keep pushing on until they do it. So mm. then it just comes down to the quality of the thing. But for me personally, and why I should not be our Elden Ring correspondent, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just that's that's such a like like mental like obstacle to kind of get over. That um, yeah, it's sort of you're you're I the, can't ba- get you're the best we have. The, I can't get excited about the bigger picture because I don't know if I'll be able to see any of it. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's sort of how I feel. The the, all this accessibility talk definitely makes me more interested because there is a point where I'm just like, can I, can I be arsed? I want, I want to see your game. You can get, like, give me a challenge, but like, I don't know if it's going to be just at pain all the time. I'm like, mm. ah, I don't know. I can't be fucked. But yeah, we will see when it comes to Elden I just want to see those big monsters. They, they do look amazing. I mean, I've watched that trailer a lot. Just because I like the monster designs in it. So, fingers crossed. They're good monsters. They're good monsters. Uh, another game that has kind of monster, weird looking creatures, at least from trailers and all that, that we've seen. Although I have a feeling Elden Ring will be out before this. Uh, and that's Everwild. So Everwild was announced back in 2019. And there were a number of people who expected to see it at this year's E3. I think even we mentioned it last week and you were talking about uh, the most recent trailer and how you could see the the building blocks of a game here. So you were thinking, my God, there's a good chance that it would show up at this Mm. year's E3. Uh, But the only thing we saw from Rare was their Sea of Thieves Johnny Depp DLC. And after that, I think it was, Games Beats Jeff Grubb, the game's leaker, uh, he said last weekend, and then VGC said that their sources, they went on to say the same thing, that the studio restarted development from scratch at some point between us first seeing it and now. Uh Grubb mentioned a 2023 launch. VGC said it could be 2024. And in their report, VGC said, as of last year, the game was a third person adventure with God game elements, we were told. One person said that, in particular, a mandate from Rare's leadership to not have any combat in the game has led to roadblocks in design. I like the idea of people are like, <laughs> it's like this killing is so just inbuilt to the games we play that you're like, well, you're not allowed to kill anything. And you're like, what, well, <laughs> what are we going to do with all these animals? <laughs> Look at them. Stroke them, like uh, 
hit him with a hammer? Oh no, that's killing. No, I, I literally don't know what to do. <laughs> you could take pictures of him, I suppose, but then people will just say, your Pokemon Snap. Get off your high horse. Mm. So then you just go, all right, we'll kill the animals then. <laughs> um, yeah, um, bit of a shame to hear that this one appears to be a bit further out than maybe we first mm. anticipated. Uh, I mean, yeah, it is, it is a bit funny that like, the fact that you can't hurt these animals or whatever it is. We shouldn't say that. It's just combat, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not, it's kind of refreshing that they want to, you know, mm-hmm. do something different and try something different. And it has that kind of sort of like, you know, love, love your environment, sort of your one with the natural world kind of energy in, in what they have shown. So that would, that would make sense. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess it's sort of hot, you know, a thing we didn't know much about has now gone in a direction that we don't know much about. Uh, did you anticipate what VGC said there? L- like they say, as of last year, so, th- you know, things yeah. may have changed. But that it was a third person adventure with God game elements. I mean, it had that, that sort of look to, I mean, you know, the third person, you could obviously see mm-hmm. characters and they seem to be like interacting with the environment, you know, you know drawing, you know, magicking trees and things i mean you could almost sort of see a version of that game which has sort of like a third person sort of not as not not a planet zoo or a kind of zoo tycoon type thing but something about like interacting with like ecosystems and you know te- you know growing creating spaces mm. for certain animals or whatever i mean that would also kind of play in a little bit to, uh, you know, what they, you know, sort of what they did with Viva Pinata, I guess. You know, Rare has sort of form. Fair. Of, like, let's, let's deal with a space where things live and what happens in that space. You know, they've obviously got, they're still sitting on all the expertise that made those games. Um, so, so why, why not use that knowledge? Yeah, it's not mm-hmm. a huge leap. You know, it's not like saying well, the Call of Duty guys are going to make a game about like looking after an elephant. You know, it'd in be a good field. though. That sounds pretty good to me. But that would be more shocking if you, you know, if you think of the Viva Pinata thing. This, this, that's that's not a, like a wild leap, an yep. ever wild leap. Oh, <laughs> um, as it's often said, this stuff is happening all the time. You know, mm-hmm. there are yeah. more games that don't make it than than do. Um, every studio has got to go through its processes. Uh, you know, I think rare have that they're lucky in that they have, you know, what is Microsoft's like only really successful service game, I'd say, unless there's something really obvious I'm missing. I don't know. Yeah. Sea of Thieves is the only one that comes to mind. And I mean, that as a lot of people will remember had a very rocky launch. So like, well, the, oh, I did. Jesus, I wouldn't people. say it was rocky. I think I think it was well, when spa- I, it was sparse, but it wasn't like yeah, it was it was boring. When I say <laughs> rocky, I I, I it don't. Was boring. Uh, it was boring though. There was fuck all to do in it. Whereas yeah, like, but they, it wasn't. Ro- I'd say rocky is like it was like broken in some. Yeah, way. when I meant rocky, I meant rocky as in people picking it up and just you know giving a shit about it. But eventually, <laughs> then they did. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, the only so one that comes like to that, mind. That probably buys you a bit of like you know leeway. Mm, indeed it does uh, so yeah we'll see when it comes to Everwild we'll see in three years or whatever it is five years uh, but forget Everwild because I have something to tell you right now Matthew as upcoming as a right angle full of technical doodads it is Tech Corner and over the past week there were some leaked screenshots of Windows 11 doing the rounds, and people found this exciting. Uh, horses for courses. So, Matthew, my question to you is, have you ever had Windows installed in your house, and were you excited? Uh, yeah, well, we, we did have our Windows changed a couple of years ago, because when we moved into our house, it had these very old aluminium frames that suffered from terrible condensation. They were very, very old. And um, yeah, we had them replaced with um, some nice, some nice sort of double glazing. Ooh, um, yes, they. Uh, yeah, I, it was nice. I actually really enjoyed the installation process too because 
you know, in my head, all building takes 5,000 years because, you know, houses have to stand forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, of course, they take a long time to do. But they were in and out. I think they did it in a day, the whole house. A Um, day? Yeah, they just smashed them windows out. We had some big holes and then there weren't holes. Maybe two days tops. Well done. Do you want to yeah. give them free advertising? <laughs> Do you um, I think they were called New, new Look Windows. The Claw Shop. They were getting into windows no, as well. No, I think they were called something like that. They're, listen, they're, 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 a big, they're a big local um, window company in Bath because I can walk around and I can see, I can tell when a house has had them. Has, your, a, has your windows. Because I'm like, oh yeah, that one, that one, that one, that one. Um, well, yeah, if you're looking to get windows and bath, folks, look no further than new look. Yeah, if, if you want these, yeah, I mean, they don't do traditional, like, you know, wooden frames or anything. You'd have to get a, you know, a joinery or something for that. But let's not go too deep into the, to the window <laughs> business. Uh, so those are your headlines and hot takes for this week. So now let's talk about the video games we've been playing in show and tell. Show and tell. Show and tell, we can't afford a proper jingle. Jingle. It's meant to be jingle. Yes, we've actually played some games over the last week, which is nice. It's not just all about looking forward to what games we're going to be playing in the next couple of months. Show and tell, part of the PC Gaming Week spot, where indeed we tell you and show you uh, the games that we've played over the last week. Matthew, you have been a... A busy little boy playing all those Steam Next Fest demos. Mm. Um, I'm excited to hear about some of these some of these here video games. So, what I did was I basically just I downloaded loads and loads, but I tried to avoid things which I'd kind of already heard of because I've seen a lot of people do lists of like top ten, top fifteen Steam no, Next demos. And they're all the same game. And there are like, what, 500 or something demos? And that seems quite counterintuitive. If you only use this, basically, if everyone just uses Steam Next Fest to play fucking Sable, it's kind of not, it's completely defeated the purpose of what this was about. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Also, I played Sable. I, I didn't think it was all that. Oh, no, really? Isn't yeah. it? Oh, no, that's... I, thought it was, I thought it was very, very boring. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, but <laughs> that's, a that's shame. why I didn't include well, it on this list. <laughs> all right. Well, tell me, uh, what's the first game you're going to be talking about? The the Plane Effect, is it? Yeah, Plane Effect. Uh, this is by Studio Innovina and Studio Kiku. Um, I'd probably liken this um, because I'm very lazy and I like to liken things to other things rather mm-hmm. than come up with original genres to a kind of, uh, it's almost like a sort of a 3D kind of like limbo or inside okay it's a kind of sort of wordless storytelling puzzle experience it isn't 2d you know you you're setting these little 3d scenes we basically have to sort of work out what to do um has this sort of uh dystopian or kind of I th- it's hard to say when it is I and mean, it looks sort of futury but it's it's kind of just a bleak kind of like man living in monochrome world, going through his kind of monochrome life, a very boring routine. Um, I can relate. Um, and yeah, you, you have to kind of like work out what, what each scene is kind of sort of asking of you. You've got kind of like limited things you can interact with. It's not exactly a like point and click game. You're not in, you know, doing a lot of like inventory management or anything. Um, there are difficulty modes which do give you more guidance, but I went for just the normal no guidance mode. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, in this demo, you have to like work out how to get out of his office and then how to get a train ticket for his, uh, t- you know, to, to, to get the tube home and then how to get into his house. You know, you, you kind of walk through these city streets where there are these little kind of robots that, um, electrocute you if you, if you kind of mess with them. Um, you can die, like you can get like electrocuted on the railway tracks as I'm about to demonstrate, and then it kind of restarts you, which is the kind of uh that's what kind of put me most in mind of like your limbos and your insides. It's kind of a you know, a little bit kind of trial and error. Um you sort of throw yourself at these scenes and you just sort of poke and prod at them until you kind of sort of glean what it is you're trying to do. But um 
you know, I like the really minimalist style of it. I, I liked its sort of vibe. He's got his big coat and this sort of scarf and kind of captures this sort of, I don't know, sort of world weariness to this guy. Um, there are scenes that suggest there's like quite a bit more going on to this world. Yeah. Um, where you kind of like return to your offices and there's always sort of sort of abstract sort of observers watching you. I think there's a little clip of that um, in this footage somewhere. Um, yeah. And, and, and you're just trying to kind of pick out this story, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it's quite handsomely made. It sort of moved along at a kind of good pace. I think the team come from like a VFX kind of background. So it's got a lot of nice little sort of animation touches. Um, Did you get any sense of how, how puzzly it is like i know you likened it to to I limbo mean, they're like you know so like the, the puzzles are contained to the area you're in so like the office it's like how do you get your door card and then you open the door and there's snow coming in so you have to go and put on your coat before you leave it's not like massively right. complicated it's it's um you know there are only like three or four props in any given scene and it's more a case of of just like working out the right sequence. It's like, well, if I use this candy machine, it drops a coin. I can use that coin to get the ticket. The ticket falls down this thing. I can blow up this vent to click. It. Okay. It's, yeah. it's, it's like not trying to like hold you in place. I think it wants you to move through this world at a pretty decent kind of clip. But, um, you know, I just, I like this for, I like this like storytelling through world design and animation. I like it, you know, people who can do, tell stories and build worlds without using lots of words that that appeals to me so mm. yeah i thought this was i thought this was decent very good very good so that is the the plain effect the plain effect well, i don't know if by the time week spots out can you even uh-huh. download these anymore uh i don't think so but you oh. know it's stick them on the wish list if you like the look stick of them Stick them on the wish list yeah uh, so what what's your what's your second game you have let's for me, go Matthew? with thief's roulette uh, let's by Hiromu656 um, this has actually completely passed me by apparently it was a kickstarter thing um, quite a small kickstarter campaign I think I was looking for like 10, 10 grand or something um, and it's basically a sort of homage to uh, like the Zero Escape and Danganronpa games, which I don't know if you've played either of those. I, I haven't. I'm, I'm aware of Danganronpa, though. It's very Zero Escape. So Zero Escape's like a visual novel thriller where there's always people kind of trapped in a kind of a, sort of a maniac's kind of battle to the death. Um, but then in between the kind of visual novel segments, there are like escape room puzzles. And this is basically that. I mean, it, it's, it's really like, I mean, the Kickstarter puts its hands up and says, this is what I'm, you know, I really like these kind of games, so I decided to make my own. Um, the kind of the scenario is they're kind of keeping it secret, so that the demo is a kind of like is manufactured for the demo's purposes. So it doesn't oh. really place you in the game or tell you exactly what's happening. But as in the Zero Escape games, you are part of a you know there are a lot of people involved in some wider game. I think the thing which is sort of holding them in place, they keep referring to this character called Luck or Lady Luck who is their kind of tormentor and all these people are in a location. They've been split into teams. You are currently solving puzzles with one of the team. I didn't really get an inkling of what the wider kind of what the wider structure is, like what the game is, what the nature of it is kind of what's holding them there. Mm. Um, But otherwise, yeah, this was, this was the demo was mainly this escape room segment. So you're going around solving like, you know, all kinds of like logic puzzles, some light point and click elements, some item combination, um, but largely kind of like extracting kind of codes from visual puzzles in the environment and sort of like quite abstract sort of hints, um, which is very true to um, uh, the Zero Escape games. It's like first person, like fully moving around, uh, which uh, the... The, the zero escape games weren't they were like more static like sort of manipulation so um that's kind of interesting like you could that in fact that this walking around seeing the characters that's a lot more like dangan romper um which had these segments where you go and talk to the characters um i really like the games it's based on uh 
you know, the the big question is whether it's got like the story to kind of deliver. I mean, the 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 environments and the puzzles themselves felt like a little sparse in this demo, but you know, I don't know if it's just been made for the demo, so it's, you don't want to sort of judge it on that. Yeah. Um, like one thing I liked about the locked rooms in Zero Escape is that they were like based on the purpose of the room. So like one of them would be a kitchen and there'd be like the puzzles would have like a kitchen theme, for example, okay. or there'd be like a lab or a thing. This is this space is a little bit like it just feels like a, a weird concrete chamber full of quite abstract puzzles. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, interesting, you know, it, it's it's a, a genre of game I really enjoy. Glad someone else is making something in it. Um, so yeah, think mm. through that. I am color me intrigued. Ooh, uh, yeah, no, it, it does. It looks nice. Now, uh, tell me about a filthy, dirty game, Matthew. Grime. <laughs> what, what's this? What's grime about? Grime. Uh, this is by Cloverbyte. This is a sort of a Metroidvania-ish, Dark Soulsy, two D action RPG um, with this quite abstract opening, which I decided to include in the clip. It's <laughs> all very odd and suggestive yes, um, it <laughs> and uh when you actually see the game proper i the relevance of this is, is maybe like lost uh, <laughs> <laughs> like it's it doesn't really look like that uh yeah it's all very very rude um this is good for the podcast listeners Pod- i it? do like the audio described two red figures <laughs> hang in a void one sprays golden juice from his mouth into the other one's gob. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, a bit Dark Souls, a bit Metroidvania. The kind of, the, the big gimmick here is that you are this sort of character made out of, like, fragments of rock, and the kind of thrust of his development seems to be, like, absorbing, like, enemies into his body to kind of get stat boosts from them. So you can like smash people up once you've got a weapon, um, or you can uh, you can kind of absorb, which is kind of like a not a parry as such, but like a timed button press. Which just as they hit you, if you absorb them, you can kind of pull monsters into yourself. And if you pull enough of one monster into yourself, you unlock powers associated with it. Huh. So, like each enemy type clearly represents like a different sort of like passive stat boost so like there's like little there's like pots with arms that punch you and if you absorb like six of those arms you can like incorporate the withered limbs like stamina boost or something um so that there's this sort of i guess there'll be like this dilemma about like just smashing stuff safely or kind of absorbing it for that bigger benefit um you know, I don't know if it's going to have like you have to absorb certain enemies to get certain abilities. Like, I don't know if it'll be a, like an ability led Metroidvania in terms of like the map. There's lots of jumping and climbing. You know, he seems pretty, pretty capable in this opening map anyway. Um, I just thought this had a, a, a quite a strange sort of energy. You know, the monster designs were quite odd. This whole kind of like creepy sort of mannequin kind of hero character who kind of absorbs stuff into him. Is kind of unusual. Um, I guess it kind of gave me hints of some of the 2D Castlevanias where you could absorb monsters or kind of capture monsters for like special attacks and things. And the idea of like building your character from your enemies, you know, that's 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 always quite a, a fun kind of gimmick. Um, yeah, I mean, the the there's a reason many people use the Mega Man. S- Sort of like you take on the abilities of your enemies is because it yeah, works. Yeah, I mean it's yeah, it's 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 like a yeah, sort of rock solid idea. I'm you know interested to see where the game goes. Like visually, obviously, you're in this quite sort of dour kind of cave to begin with. Um, you know, I haven't really looked much more beyond this in terms of like you know what they're proposing for the rest of the game or how you know how the kind of environment changes. Um, but it was you know like. Pretty, pretty solid. I, I played a couple of Metroidvania things from the Steam demos, and this this was the one which sort of felt the sort of most interesting. Hmm. Um, actually, probably Cast- like more Castlevania than Dark Souls is probably fair. It's it's more of the action RPG, you know, like Bloodstained was recently. It's it's it 
probably handles a bit more like that. Um, but yeah, kind of odd, strange thing. It is but. strange. I mean, I am trying to figure out what was the purpose of the red people blowing gold dust into each other's mouths. What? Well, I think that, I don't know, it's like the birth of you is this weird creature and now you're, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's, it's all very odd, but it's, it's you know, it strange seems, one, yeah. it seems, it seems like re- reasonably slick. Um, yeah. What, what yeah. can you want from a Steam demo? You go in not knowing Indeed. anything about it and you come out with a vague idea that it's interesting. Grime. Uh, so yeah. Grimey boy. Wish list that if you're into it. And Matthew, you played one more. Yeah. Well, uh, I played quite a well, few. These are the ones yeah. I recommend. You, yeah, I played you're... some. I won't name them because I don't want to dunk on stuff. I played a couple of things that were absolute shit. I mean, <laughs> and it just really bums me out with that stuff because, you know, What's the point of taking something relatively obscure and just waving it in front of people and saying, this is terrible? Like, I don't know, it doesn't feel like it helps anyone. Uh, So tell us about a good computer game that you played. Yeah, this is The Rewinder by Misty Mountain Studio. Um, I I don't know much about the studio, where they're from, but the game is uh, very sort of um, based and influenced on by sort of Chinese mythology. Um, You play as a character called Chi Yun, um, who is the rewinder of the title. And you're kind of a, I guess, sort of a sort of a mystical problem solver. You've been sent from the underworld, um, you know, which is full of these sort of strange kind of demonic characters um, to this sort of village where something's gone wrong. And I think I think that the notion of the rewinder name is that you're meant to like get to the heart of the problem and like reset the time, you know, like you can kind of go back into the past and like change to to get a happier future. So you're like rewinding people's problems. Maybe. Right. I think is, is the, is the vibe. Um, It's not brilliantly explained. I would say Um, it's a point and click game. Um, What I liked about this was the kind of combination of um, it's kind of going for this sort of like, sort of ink art style but done with pixel graphics so it's you can sort of sort of see its sort of influences in in some uh, sort of chinese art but sort of translated into this sort of pixel point and click style um it's got some really like i i really like that you know it's collecting bits of the inventory and you know combining objects with other objects and all all that kind of fun stuff um, but it's also got some like embedded puzzles um, and like like devices and machines for you to kind of interact with, which feel a bit more kind of um, sort of uh, oh the white thing to sort of liken them to. It reminded me a little bit of Dark Side Detective actually, which has the kind of inventory management side, but then it also had sort of like almost like bits of the scenery that you'd kind of zoom in on to kind of like try and sort of swivel some tiles to kind of activate something or combine right. objects on this craft table or there's something with this sort of scale where you're balancing all these weights. It, it kind of um, has this sort of broad palette for the, for the meat of the game, but then can also get like really specific in like certain puzzles, which I really liked. So it, it kind of feels like a bit more ambitious than just a straight up sort of point and click game. You know, it has some like this kind of stuff. I guess you could call them mini games. Probably the easiest mm. way of, of of describing it. But you know, there is some other stuff going on in the game, which is interesting. And that combined with the quite unusual style, it's got this sort of uh, you know, it's quite atmospheric, kind of sort of spooky kind of energy to it. Um, it's you know, an unusual setting or, or a setting we don't see in a lot of Western games. Um, I should have probably looked up to see where the studio's from. Um, I think the fact that the game can be played in English or Chinese suggests it's a Chinese team. Um, but uh, yeah, I just thought this was cool. I like point and click games. I like this kind of um, sort of resurgence we're seeing of like very, you know, sort of super sort of retro looking kind of point and click games, you know, like Dark Side Detective. This, mm-hmm. this kind of has some of that like visual energy too. Um, yeah, seems neat. Very good. So I know you're bringing those four to the table, but like very quickly, was there any other games that 
you kind of caught your eye or any other ones uh, you wanted to mention? Not really. Like, like I say, a lot of the ones I played, I didn't really like. I, like, I wasn't wild about Sable. Um, I know lots of people are, so I'm probably in the minority. Um, I played that one about the post, the, oh, yeah. the, the male yeah, yeah. person going around the lake. I didn't think that was very good. Um, that there's a lot of them are like, and this might just be personal taste. I felt like there are a lot of games which were like about super chilled living or like take your time and just relax and kind of get back to the kind of the old fashioned ways. And maybe those games just don't speak to me, but I, I find them very, very drab. Um, mm, like jazz. Sort of, I don't know. They're like chilled sort of like mood pieces almost. And um, it, it might just be that's, that's not for me. Um, so I figured I'd talk about a couple of things which I did like. Um, very good, very good. Yes, yeah, sadly, I do think that most of the people, when they're listening or watching to this, those games will be gone. But you know, if you liked what you heard or yeah, saw, I mean, stick them on the wish list, as we said. A lot of these demos resurface when they do these demo thing. You know, they they tend to do them a few times, and there's so many online festivals where you'll get a chance to like resurface these demos now that you can um, get onto them and. Yeah, wish listing seems to be a thing. I think that like that, do, that does help a lot. Yeah. People, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's the Steam answer to like and subscribe, isn't it? Indeed, indeed, it is. Listen to the Electronic Wireless Show, RockPaperShotgun.com's PC gaming podcast. I'm Nate. I'm Matthew. And I'm Alice. And every Thursday, we chat about our favourite things in PC games. That could be the greatest giants, the coolest magic, or the best mysteries. Although Alice will have to stop me making every episode all about fish, or Anthony Hopkins, or Rome. So check out the Electronic Wireless Show every Thursday, available on all your podcatching apps or direct from RockPaperShotgun.com. I didn't play four demos. I played one singular video game, and that game is uh, came out about two weeks ago now at this stage. Uh, but I had time to play it over the last weekend and wanted to highlight it here. That game is Chicory, a colourful tale. So this is a joint effort amongst a number of different developers. But I suppose the lead man is Greg Lobanov, who is most known for the 2019 indie game Wonder Song, which was where you played as this singing bard. I thought it was a pleasant idea, but I thought that game lost steam relatively quickly for me. Right. But Chicory's is a new game. And yeah, as I said, it came out about two weeks ago. And what an absolute delight this video game is. Oh, good. It is the perfect game to throw yourself into if you've, you know, you're wrecked from E3 or life or whatever it is, your circumstances. So the best shorthand to use to describe Chicory is that it is a a puzzle-heavy, top-down Legend of Zelda-like, but without combat, mostly. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of combat that I'll talk about in a minute. In this world of... As you can see, if you're watching this, walking, talking animals, you play as a dog that's inherited this paintbrush that you use to colour in this world, this world that oh, that is all, <laughs> all black and white. The previous artist is Chicory. They used colour in the world, but they've fallen in hard times, essentially. So yeah, when you come into an area, the world is split up into screens, essentially. Mm. It's like, like pictures. Uh, for the first time, all you see is the page of a colouring book. Like everything has really fat outlines mm. of like objects and people and buildings, etc. So then you use your brush to colour in the world. On PC, I will say, I mean, I haven't played it on console, but I, I found this was the best way to play it. Like move your character around with sad W and then move the paint brush around with the mouse. I think it actually works quite well. You can, you know, you can paint however you want. You can just splash paint about the place or you can intricately fill in each object with one of the colours available to you because the colours available to you depends on the area you're in. But it isn't just about making pretty pictures. Mm. Painting is how you interact with the world. It's how you push the buttons that control platforms or even like some of the trees and mushrooms in the world or other uh, plants and whatever else. When you paint them, 
or erase the paint that's on them, they may react and that can aid your progression. And even even later on, as you play through the game, you're gaining abilities and later on you get the ability to splatoon yourself through paint. And that is how you can get through small gaps and places you couldn't before. Mm. So if you if you want, you don't have to paint every last area. Paint in whatever you want that will actually help you make your way through the game. Because like at the, at the start, that's what I was doing. But it kind of felt a bit lifeless. Right. Which I suppose is, th- that's the intent, you know. Walking around what is essentially this living colouring book, it just feels wrong to see it devoid of colour. So mm. but yeah, I, I'm not going to say I spent the entirety of the game meticulously drawing in every character because the game does definitely go on a tad too long and my patience for works of art was wearing a little thin but it it is still just really nice making the world kind of a lovely brighter place for all the sweet townsfolk that you meet as you play on not only the abilities but you gain other things like brush styles which are like you can get textured strokes and etc etc so like if you want and if you get good enough at this you could probably make some really shit hot little paintings and another little thing about the painting is that your paintings are persistent so it actually does help you kind of make your way around this this open world so you can see where you've been before you know if you come into an area that you haven't been it's probably going to be black and white like chicory is very keen to kind of help you along the way and for you to tackle the game at your own pace Mm. there are side quests there are collectibles Little bits of clothing for you to wear, etc. There are these lost cats for you to find. Call me interested. Matthew's interested, but if you've no interest in doing all of that, that's fine. Do whatever you want. If you just want to actually just paint in all the pretty pictures, crack on. And the puzzles as well. They're they're mostly not handy, I won't say that. But like they're not gonna completely destroy your brain. You look at this and maybe you think any sort of puzzles in this are are gonna be a piece of piss, but they're not. They're actually quite, quite well done. I did want to bring up the music because like, I get the art style is obviously the bread and butter of this game. It's very simple, but terrifically effective going hand in hand with the main mechanic, etc., etc. But the music is fantastic. Mm. Again, looking at this, you might think, oh, it's going to be all plinky plonky and piano bollocks. It's not like there, there's melody <laughs> to each track. There's heart there. It isn't all nice, easy listening stuff. There, are, there is nice stuff, but you have guitars on top of piano. You have relaxing horns, easy. <laughs> but then, you know, it's, it's, it's as you go along, it's infused with kind of some of harsher electronic and bass. Some of the harsher tracks, which you hear during the boss battles are some of my favourite ones. If you're watching this, you have seen some some combat. Yes, there is boss battles in here. Uh, It is the only time the combat pops up. You're not just whacking big monsters over the head with a brush. It's still... It ties into the themes of the game, I suppose, or the the main mechanic of the game. Uh, Because typically there's a big eye on the screen and at times you're able to just waggle your brush on that eye and then that'll do damage. These boss battles are pretty forgiving in that if you take, I think it's two hits, you'll die. But when you die, you're instantly thrown in back at the point where you died. So the checkpointing is very, very forgiving. Like the first time this happens, I did think it was a bit jarring because it is quite, quite a nice and upbeat game generally. Uh, on the surface at least. As you go on, you can learn that the boss battles actually tie into the main themes of the game very, very well. You know, if you do have trouble with the boss battles, the the game does give you a lot of accessibility options. Like you can just skip boss battles outright, I think. Uh, There's loads of accessibility options. Like you can get rid of the kind of splooshy, squishy noise of paint as well which I think there's a name for it. There's a phobia people have, I think. paint? No, of like the splooshy, squishy painting noise. Mm-hmm. I love it so I was like turn that shit up it's very satisfying <laughs> but yeah I, I kind of mentioned the themes and the kind of story I work on the internet I suppose where a large portion of my day to day can be judged by people whenever they like and uh, however harshly they want and this game it sort of looks at that uh, and it's very easy to sort of hear that and go oh no what's this going to be but the execution is actually fantastic uh, and I think it works on other levels as well. Like, I w- I'm not going to spoil anything, of course, but it essentially revolves around people who 
create things and then the struggles that they deal with. Your usual self-doubt, imposter syndrome, criticism, depression, etc., etc. So like while, say, musicians or a filmmaker or an author or whatever else might gel with this more than others, the main themes are still relatable to anyone that's made something for a significant other, a birthday card or a family member or whatever. I don't mm. know. Do you remember that time you made that card for your mom, Matthew, and she said it looked like shite and you were only six years old? Well, like, th- then you're able to relate to this game, essentially. Oh, OK. Good. To- I look forward to reliving those past traumas. I'm well, <laughs> I- I'm well impressed with how it handles the story. It rarely gets preachy. It doesn't feel too saccharine. Maybe there are a few characters in there, but like a negligible uh, amount. Uh, it's overall really well done. I don't know. I, I wasn't expecting to fall for this game as much as I have. It's not perfect. Again, I, ha- I haven't gone into it loads, but there is definitely a point in the game where it feels like a natural conclusion. And then it goes on for about two hours more, which is <laughs> not great, I suppose. But still, one of the better games I've played in 2021. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Came out of nowhere for me, at least. So, mm. yeah, get on chicory if you like painting stuff, I suppose. <laughs> uh, or imposter well, syndrome, well, one or the other. <laughs> uh, so, those are the video games that we've played over the last week. So now let's test the knowledge of one another in something we like to call Mystery Steam Reviews. <laughs> Mystery Steam Reviews is the part of the PC Gaming Week spot where I, Colin Mahern, and he, Matthew Castle, test the knowledge of one another via Steam Reviews that are a mystery. And the rules are as follows. Both I and Matthew bring three Steam Reviews to the MSR Arena, but we omit the name of the game associated with each review. Our opponent must correctly guess the game attached to each review. One correct answer equals one point. It makes sense. While both of us have 90 seconds on each MSR, we both also have help in the form of three lifelines. These lifelines can be used at any stage during battle and also pause that 90 second timer. Each lifeline can only be used once and once only. And they are as follows. Publisher with a hot seat haver learns the publisher of the game. Second opinion where a second review is given to the fiery chair sitter. And genre where the genre of the game is revealed to the one with the warm arse. Now, I gave the people three choices, two of which I thought were interesting choices and would have made for something, you know, <laughs> I, 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 uh, maybe one of those spicy or well contested, I will say, mystery steam reviews. The people chose the one I didn't expect them to choose, which was uh, games mm-hmm. that launched out of Steam Early Access. So when they came to Steam first, Early Access but they have since reached 1.0. Right. (laughs) Have you done that, yeah? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, they're all things that that were once in early access. Yeah. Um, So... Yeah, uh, I mean, I will say, if there's a good category that doesn't get voted for, you can put it back in the Oh, no, they they, they get recycled. They do get recycled. It's not like it's dead forever. No, 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 no. Um, Like... I, I, I do want to point out, I think all of yours are gettable games. However, like, as in, they're games that you are aware of. Right. But I, I will also say, I may be even less confident than last week's E3 one, purely because, you know, early access games, survival and management. Two genres that I don't think either of the two of us are all that off a with. But we'll see. We'll see how yeah, we get it. Yeah, on. yeah. Uh, I'm going to guess Don't Star for all of them. Uh, So, Matthew, here is your first Mystery Steam review. The best creepy door opening simulator. And that's from the boss stage. It is recommended Mm -hmm. 6.8 hours on record, 4.2 hours at time of review. Matthew, your time starts now. Creepy door opening. So a game which has got creepy doors doors that you do something weird with that does not sound like a management game that does not sound like a survival game um there are a lot of uh early access like roguelikes um so it could be 
like it sounds more like it's coming from that side of things like a game where you've got creepy doors oh sh yikes hey yikes this is uh, quite hard <laughs> creepy door uh, this, uh, second opinion okay pause the timer at 41 Matthew uses his second opinion so dangerous to use it this early the second opinion of this mystery steam review art comes in many forms a horror masterpiece and I'm restarting the timer 41 seconds now art comes in many forms a horror masterpiece a horror masterpiece with creepy doors early access you know what actually this could be layers of fear because you said ah, oh, and that made me think of layers of fear and I think that weirdly was early access because I can remember there was a demo you walked around like opening a few cupboards so I remember thinking this is going to be terrible and then people really like the final game. You know what? I think it actually... I think that might be that. I think I say layers of fear. Is that your final answer? That's my final answer. Sound effects work this week, kids. It's good. So, at the start, Creepy Door Simulator was thinking... There's a lot of roguelikes there in Steam Early Access. And Creaky something to do door, with that. I could understand. Lots of... The second opinion said art comes in many forms. A horror masterpiece. He said, there's a lot of that painting going on in Layers of Fear. This has ended up on you submitting Layers of Fear as an, uh, an answer. So, Matthew, I can tell you that the correct answer is... Layers of Fear. Thank you, second opinion. Matthew, could I have my first Mystery Steam review, please? The developers themselves classify this game as both a Metroidvania and a roguelike, but neither is accurate. This game is essentially an action platformer that incorporates only a few basic elements from these genres and doesn't do it well, <laughs> says Nads Catalyst. They do not recommend it after 15 hours. Uh, time starts now. Well... Ned's Catalyst, very cross. So it, it uh, Metroidvania and a roguelike. Um, action platformer, blah, blah, blah. All right, so the only one that comes to mind is Dead Cells. I know that was Steam Early Access. And that's the only one that comes to mind so I am sort of I am drawn to just say final answer like I could go through publisher, second opinion genre do you know what, let's take a punt let's say dead cells Matthew you sure? not really but Is let's, that, li let's live on the edge final right or die. answer final answer so, you've, uh... This is Dead Cells, I haven't really got, got anything else to say. <laughs> I can't really remember how you got to this answer. <laughs> you, you said Dead Cells. <laughs> is it? <laughs> Let's find out. The correct answer is... <laughs> Dead Cells. <laughs> to be honest, I just got to the answer because it's like, I can't... My mind You're has like, gone oh, blank. It's the only... That. It's, a, it's the only, um... So there are some Metroid things even that. Chris Tarrant can't inject drama into. <laughs> uh, Matthew, I, we're doing well so far. I'm quite impressed with our performance in early access games. Here is your second Mystery Steam review. First game series name, but cold. Really, I have no idea what else to say. And that's from J7 Squared. It's recommended... 12.9 hours on record. So it's a, it's a bit of a model one, so I'll say it again. I say, what they're saying is, it's the sentence is missing a like at the start, or similar to the first oh, right. game. So it's, it's like, yeah. It's, so li it's, it's like, like the first one, but cold. Ah, but cold. Uh, like the first Gears of War, but cold. Uh, so your time starts now. It's like, what, what are early access games? It's like, 
Oh, God. Cold. A factory... No, there's no factory managing games set in the ice. Something that is cold. A game that has a snow update. Um... That dinosaur one? Is that an... What, A, was that early access? And B, did it have a cold thing? That doesn't sound right. Um... Uh, can I get a genre? Uh, you can. Pause the timer. 51. As Matthew uses his genre. Uh, the genre of this is... An open world survival action adventure video game. An open world survival action adventure video game. And I will stress again that review. It's like, this game is like the first one, but it's cold. Uh, yeah. So, so restart so, the timer so, so, now. So it's it's like another thing, but it's cold. It's um. Oh, and it could be that um. The submarine one. That's just had an icy update. Oh, that has that thing. Is that out of early access? What was that? Oh, what even the fuck is it called? It's like. It's like sub explorer. The chili update. <laughs> no, it's the. What's that game? Called? What's the watery one called? So that's like that. That would, that had a foot. Ah, uh, it's not called Submariner. What the fuck is it called? You know the one I'm talking about. I think it's called the Frozen, <laughs> Frozen, not the Frozen, Frozen Wilds. Sub, sub, <laughs> Submariner. Fuck, fuck, Sub, Submariner. The Frozen <laughs> Adventure. <laughs> <laughs> it's not called that. What the fuck is that game called? You know the one I'm talking about. So you go, you go into the, the cold. <laughs> so, uh, pretty straightforward <laughs> review. It's like this game is like the first game, but it's cold. Uh, the you use your genre lifeline. Told you it was an open world uh, survival game, which made you think of. The Subnautica sequel. Subnautica, not fucking Shit, Submariner. I've given it away. The correct answer is <laughs> Subnautica Below Zero. Oh! <laughs> Submariner The Frozen Adventure. Oh, sorry, I took the drama out of it there by a little slip of the tongue by saying the real name. Um, yeah, oh, Matthew, you were so close. I knew you... You knew what it was. Subnautica. So, Matthew, could I have my second mystery steam review, please? Cool, but why add some vegetarian update? I'm trying to get more blood and violence in here, not Vigo diet for death row, says Xenos. They recommend it with 133.1 hours on record. Time starts now. Ah, oh, a vegetarian update. Get more blood and vi violence. I'm not here for a Vigo diet for death row. Um, all right. I know very little about Prison Architect, but that's the only prison game I can think of right now. Um, I don't know if it has death row in it, but I, I mean, I also don't know if this Steam review is being, uh, I, like, you know, it could be using death row incorrectly or in a different way. Uh, a vegetarian update. Um, and death Row is what I call the Mushroom Kingdom, so... Uh, a vegetarian update. It could be Prison Architect. Yeah, why is, not? Let's see if I can do... Answer? See if I can do the No Lifeline run. Uh, yes, the final answer. So, vegetarian option three, but you saw the word death row and you thought, prison architect, or did I just include a review with a prison sounding word to lure you towards prison architect? The correct answer is prison architect. Yes! Go on, my son. All right, mm. let's let's try for the no lifeline run, eh? Mm. Um, very well done, sir. Uh, happy with that, Matthew. Your third mystery steam review is as follows: 
full of cheaters, connection problems, slow updates, unbalanced guns, terrible matchmaking, idiot bots. And that's from Disaster. It is not recommended, 410 hours on record, 391 hours at review time. Matthew, your time starts now. Well, listen, like, like this is going to sound like bad losing now because of the whole... Mo- like the moan. Correct, it does, yeah, yeah. So, it, I wish I hadn't moaned before this, because I think this is, like, legitimately a bad review. In that it describes any online shoot, Like, you could write that about any online shooter, I think. So... I'm going right. to pray that well, the publisher... No, in, in, in that case... Uh, well, no, look, let's no, pause no, no, the timer. No, 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 let's, no, 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 let's, let's pause the timer. Give, give me the publisher, and I will work it out. I'll pause you know. the timer. I'll give you the publisher. The publisher of this video game is Crafton Incorporated. And I'll give you a second rev- uh, opinion, Matthew. I'll give you a second opinion. You don't have to. I'm just going to echo what most reviews say. When it was launched, and for some time after, I had tons of fun as you can see by my hours played. At one point, it went downhill fast. A Chinese company bought it, or part of it, uh, lots of push for paid extras, cheaters ran rampant, it's a mere shell of the game it used to be. Your timer restarts now. Genuinely craft on. This is going to be something really obvious, and I have just no idea. Even with that gracious second opinion, which you didn't need to give me, I mean... So it's born by China. Chinese companies bought everything. Everything. Every game studio is partly owned by Chinese. I'm partly owned by a Chinese company. I am Tencent Presents, Matthew Castle. And I am not good at this game. I, uh... Craft on. I don't. I, that name just doesn't ring a bell. Is this? Is that? Should I? Should it? Is it? I don't know. PUBG. That's PUBG. Is that your final answer? Yeah. Oh, that's the wrong one. So <laughs> you used your second second opinion. Uh, <laughs> I didn't which, use it. You kindly gave it to me, which, which makes me look really fucking sour uh which reveals that you know a chinese company bought this developer or this game or whatever it said spoke away was talking about it like it was you know a shooter on balanced guns etc etc and rather than doom it you've just said what's a game with shooting in it pubg player unknown's <laughs> battlegrounds <laughs> And I can tell you, Matthew, that the correct answer is Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Uh, I don't feel I can I can punch the air for that one because well, I know what's going to happen in the comments. Everyone's going to be like, "You shouldn't have given him the second opinion. He was making a fuss." It's a game. It's a stupid game. I know, but you game. shouldn't indulge. You shouldn't indulge me when I'm being a baby. Um, I'm like I am willing you now to get the three for three with no clues, <laughs> just so that I don't because. If it's a draw, people might be like, fuck Castle. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, I'm desperate to avoid that. <laughs> All right, uh, Matthew, could I have my third and final mystery steam review, please? Ruin an ecosystem with nothing but a vacuum, says Amoxie. They recommended it after 14.3 hours. Uh, time starts now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now... The only thing that comes to mind is Dyson Sphere Program, purely because of the name Dyson, uh, and they make vacuum cleaners, and maybe that's something you do in Dyson Sphere Program. I, I have no idea what that game is apart from the name of it, and for a period of time earlier, I think it was earlier this year, it was quite popular. Uh, and seeing as I'm trying not to use any of my lifelines. Has Dyson Sphere Program come out of early access? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Let's say Dyson Sphere program. I can't think of You're anything else. You're not going to use your lifelines. Yeah, I don't think I am. <laughs> That's your final answer. I mean, a, a, a vacuum. All done. Luigi's Mansion's the only other one I can think of. I don't think that was in Steam Early Access. Um, let's... Yeah, I want I want the No Lifeline run. Yeah, Dyson Sphere Program, <laughs> final My answer. Word. That is... That is bold. And your, wrong. <laughs> your lust for the No Lifeline run. I mean... It's impressive if you can pull it off. If you don't pull it off, it looks incredibly dumb. <laughs> you have focused in on vacuum. <laughs> you think this is a play on Dyson Sphere. What's what's his full name? Pro program. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably not that thing. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. Maybe I'll just play with you for drama. <laughs> Dyson Sphere program. You've made the connection for Dyson. No <laughs> lifelines. I hope you're right. The correct answer is Slime Rancher. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh well. That's yeah. like getting to million dollar. The million pound question. And Having you've got, like, ask, phone you've a friend. Got, like, a life, you've got the phone, the friend, and your friend is like literally like a robot that has got Wikipedia in its head. Yep. Yeah. yeah and yeah. you went, you know what? I'm going to guess. <laughs> yes. All right. I see, I've learned a lesson. I shouldn't be bra brazen. That was, if that, I... was, that was pure hubris. And now <laughs> everyone's going to be like, fuck Castle because we drew, but only because you took pity on me. Why didn't you use your lifelines to win? Yeah, I uh, yeah, I was fool. I was silly. I just I I could smell the no lifeline run. I could taste it. You went it. for a game. You don't even know what it's about. <laughs> Dyson. I think it's still in early access as well. Is it? Mm, okay. I think so. That is mystery Steam reviews for this week. Uh, so now let us answer some of the people's burning questions. <laughs> Yes, burning questions is the part of the Piece of Gaming Week spot where we indeed take your correspondence, your burning questions. You can email us at any stage throughout the week, weekspot at rockpapershotgun.com. And then we might read it out on this here show. So, Matthew, let's start off with the main person, Mog, who gave us 10 English pounds during the YouTube premiere of last week's week spot. And Mog said, over the course of your games journalism careers, thank you, Mog, <laughs> as well, uh, uh, ha, ha, uh, how has your approach to E3 changed? And do you enjoy the experience more or less or just differently? In earlier years. Thank you very much, Mog. You're a star. Um, so yeah, how has your approach to E3 changed, Matthew? Has it changed? Um, yeah, and the big difference is when I used to be on magazines, you know, as long as the deadline wasn't on E3, you had a bit more time to digest it, which I really liked. Um, and now in this age where everything is just like the fastest reaction, you know whether on YouTube or on sites or whatever, it's just, it's absolutely relentless. Like trying to keep up with it is an abs is a nightmare. And you're basically forced to make all these terrible takes before you've had a time to kind of absorb anything or even know what you're dealing with. Um, so that's, I'd say it's a little less enjoyable for that, but not everyone had the pleasure of doing it in print. Um, also, it just changes so much on whether you're there or not. Doing it from a distance mm. is just... It's not, it's not as good. Like you can cover it from afar quite nicely, and actually being able to just see everything you know, from a distance is good. But when you're there, like it's, everything's much realer, and you can talk to the devs, and that's, that's, that's always really good fun. Um, yeah, I suppose it, it sort of depends on what your 
main well yeah well what your actual aim is like if you're writing up if, if you're doing news and uh catching up on all the trailers and whatever else that's being shown off during say a microsoft press conference then you're probably better off doing that from home or doing it I from mean, an office or whatever rather than trying to do it whilst watching the thing happen in yeah. front of you i mean there were past e3s on rps where like i literally worked through the night as in you know I was putting the finishing to touches to videos at like six in the morning to hit like certain embargoes and get certain things done to be the first there. And, you know, it makes all the difference. If you land one of those big videos, you can really get ahead of it, but it's, it's rotten as well. So, mm. um, yeah, but that's the internet, isn't it? That is the internet. The internet is rotten. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, mm. do re- or do rang a tang. Uh, messaged us and said, I just played Silicon Dreams for the first time Mm -hmm. and was amazed that someone had effectively uh, adapted the voice comp test from Blade Runner into a video game. Do you have any memorable scenes or concepts from other media that you wish were, uh, you wish some insane indie developer would turn into an entire video game? Interesting question. Yeah. I mean, I would love... I suppose we've had them, have we? I was going to say, and I'm not even too sure how you would do it. Would it would it just become a rhythm action game? Would it just be Parappa the Rapper? Uh, but I would love a musical video game. Um, maybe that is just a rhythm action game. But like, for example, the the start, the most recent Saints Row is Saints Row Get Out of Hell. Pretty not terrific video game. The start of Saints Row Get Out of Hell is marvellous. It is mm-hmm. an excellent musical number uh, and then they just drop it and they never touch that again. I'd nearly, I'd actually, Saints Row would be the perfect game to do a musical with. Um, like, yeah, I'm not sure how you yeah, do that, but... I'd say, uh, I mean, obviously people have tried to make a game of this before, but the, um, you know, that, the the, the scene, you know, the scenes in like the thing where they're like testing each other to see who the who the kind of who the thing is, and the kind of paranoia and the drama of like people locked in a room and the kind of claustrophobia and the tension of you know the thing's an example, but it could be you know any number of other like murder mysteries or whatever. Mm. But that sense of like being kind of locked in and you know to have. I don't know what you'd have to do to make it work. Like some mad, like really convincing AI kind of characters that kind of like logic and reason with you and make a case for why it's not them and pin it on other people to have that to kind of deal with could be really, really cool. Um, there's, I mean, there's so much scope because they, I mean, we joked about it earlier when talking about Everwild, but in truth, a lot of video games are about murdering stuff. Um, like I, I don't know. Like, if if games could tackle a rom com, like I'd be up for that. I'd be up to see what that would what that would involve. A four weddings and a funeral. Maybe you kill or you marry four people and you kill one. Um, mm. But you could do uh, like uh, I'd be interested to see if anyone ever tried to do like a, or maybe not a film as such, but um, like the kind of telltale. Um, approach to like a sitcom where you're like juggling not life and death situations but like like a like a, like a curb your enthusiasm yeah done by telltale where you're you're just trying to balance kind of everything you've said and done to everyone i like scenes where there's like high social stakes you know where someone's like oh god if i go on that side of the room i've got to deal with that person or i've got bad history with i've screwed over this person by doing this i'm having to juggle like 10 lies at once. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, you know, I always find those kind of scenes really funny and the kind of the accumulation of them that happens in kind of sitcoms where like everything that can go wrong happens at once. Um, I'd love someone to tap into like that energy. I mean, uh, I mean, I was just trying to think of telltale done. They haven't done a sitcom, but tales from the borderlands is probably, yeah. But it's not that same thing, you know, it's almost like if you said, like, do a telltale game of, like, Cheers, and it's just that bar, 
and it's like all the madcap shit they get up to, you know, where, right, yeah. you know, oh, you know, Sam's dating two women at once and they're in different rooms of the bar and they can't find out about each other or whatever. And it's that kind of stuff. That'd that, be could be, that, that could yeah. be really fun. That would be good. Uh, Cal got in touch. Cal said, are there any genres where that were... Uh, sorry Kel said are there any genres that were historically much more active uh, example arcade sports games or arcade racers that you'd like to see have a triple A release essentially are there any genres that like you don't see much of these days yeah, but yeah. You, w- you would like to see now um, I think we've said this before about like the the sort of spluttering resurgence of like your like extreme sports or your, mm. you know, you like skate, you know, you're kind of Tony yeah. Hawk kind of games. Um, you know, it's why, uh, I think responded quite positively to that Riders, Riders Republic, Republic. Mm. cause it looked like it had a bit of that energy. And I think it's why in a way Forza Horizon is as good and, and as big as it is, is even though it's racing and it's a bit different to those sports, it has the same kind of energy. It's very like arcadey. It's very much just about like the fun fantasy of a sport rather than the super thing. I know it's works. I know there are people who are also like into their like skates or whatever. They're a bit, they're more mm. like technical versions of those. But I think it's that's that's a, that's a genre I'd like to see come back. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I mean, I don't like. There's a lot of stuff where I look at like where we are with tech and think it's so sad that that's like the th- like the 3D character platformer, which only really like Nintendo do well these days. Um, it was a mostly honking genre, I think, in its prime. Like there were a lot of very bad. You know, I'm not into like Crash and Spyro and all the the poor Sony characters. Um, and even but, N- Nintendo had some iffy ones with like banjo. Uh, not, re- not really. <laughs> um, but the idea of those bright, colourful 3D worlds done with modern tech and like what you could do with them and how amazing they could look. I mean, it's why, why I'm definitely not a fan of the 3D Sonic games. They <gasps> are. What? I didn't expect that. Go on. <laughs> outside, of, uh, outside of Nintendo, Sega are still one of the studios who will throw a considerable amount of like money and mm. effort and tech at these things. And there was a period in like 360 where, like, even though it was terrible, Sonic Unleashed or Sonic Generations, they looked amazing. You know, uh, they, Sonic they... Generations wasn't terrible. Because Sonic Generations had the 2D bits. So, uh, yeah. It's a little bit homing jump, um, which has always been the death of those games. But but yeah. they looked, you know, they looked cutting edge, and 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 you know, Nintendo's art design, you know, is stunning. But there are some technical limitations of working on the Switch. I'd love to see someone throw all of everything you can do these days at something which is a bit more like fun and colourful. That's why Psychonauts looks cool. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'd I'd love a, a 3D platformer resurgence. Um, yeah. we'll probably never get I mean the most recent high profile 3D platformer was the Yuji Naka one and that got just drawn through the coals got destroyed so he shouldn't be allowed near those games anymore I don't um, think I don't, I don't think he is like, uh, like, maybe like someone who could do it is like if if Microsoft ever did decide to do like another Banjo-Kazooie and like through like the the might of the Series X at it that could be a very mm. shiny, colourful game. Because Nuts and Bolts looked amazing. It was just a, a bit of an acquired taste, I thought. Um, if they... Yeah, if Banjo ever does come back, either make the characters talk or just have them say nothing. That would be much, much appreciated. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, Joof Inigan got in touch. They said, Dear VidBuds, are there any games or moments in games that terrified you as a child? Uh, that weren't necessarily meant to be terrifying. For example, in the adventure game Riven, there's a part where you're walking through a narrow forest path and sometimes, only sometimes, a little girl would appear and then run off. It absolutely petrified me and every time I'd go through that area, I'd have this lurking feeling of dread 
of what might be there. Love the show. Joof Inigan. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one that comes to mind straight away. And that is the very beginning of Echo the Dolphin, which shit me right that, up. That game is cursed. That has a cursed energy, I think. My God. But it's all at the very beginning. Have you, have you played, can you remember the start of Echo the Dolphin? Not in any great detail, but I've- so So like, yeah, you're Echo swimming about. It's very hard to kind of figure out what you're meant to do, but like you figure out you can talk to the other dolphins and they say things like, reach for the sky, the stars will shine on you, Echo, etc., etc. So after a while, and this is me as a whatever age child I was, because I was swimming about going, I don't know what I'm meant to do. After a while, I realised, all right, I just have to shoot up into the sky. Just like, mm. like use my kind of boost, my dolphin boost, shoot up into the sky and... I'll be able to progress. And what happens is, for those that aren't aware, when you shoot up into the sky, the screen flashes red, blood, crimson, (laughs) fucking uh, shells and dolphins are just fly all over the screen because it's just so serene before that. But then just things go fucking just absolutely bizarre. Uh, And as a child, it terrified the shit out of me. Absolutely. And I, I, yeah, I don't think it was meant to, but that's one that comes yeah. to mind for me. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> like, uh, underwater levels, just the stress became scary, you know, like mm. Sonic drowning with those, just the, the noise, the music getting uh, more intense. Um, like in Mario 64, like some of the, 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 the giant, like, uh, eels that chase you underwater were, 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 pretty frightening um i don't know i think when you're younger th- anything, anything which is kind of even gut i guess this is unintentionally scary uh i found games generally quite overwhelming as a kid like just both in, in difficult just in terms of difficulty and like you know the noise and the, the, the sound of them kind of did, did a number on me i was quite a sensitive child my parents wouldn't let me go and see jurassic park because they knew it would disturb me as a child and did was, it when you saw us uh, eventually yeah yeah for sure uh, <laughs> night, nightmares for years uh, <laughs> so they were right yeah yeah, yeah they were right too um, so I'm probably not the best judge of what is and isn't <laughs> acceptable um, um, I never got over Samuel L. Jackson's arm <laughs> Uh, but yeah, good question. Thank you for that. Yeah, um, Matt sent in a question <laughs> that I think you'll be able to answer. Hello, I've never worked in video game journalism and I was wondering what your split of playing games to quote real work is in your jobs. Given that you likely have to play a lot of games for your work, given that, yeah, uh, do you play the games in your free time and then do the writing, etc. during your work hours? Or do you reserve a certain amount of time during your work hours to play games? Matt. Now, uh, I mean, I suppose we could say what we do. It's not a catch-all for what everyone does. Uh, but kind of a mixture of both. Like, you know, you if you can, you play a little bit during work hours. You play it. I mean, Chicory, for example, like, I don't know, I, I played that all in my spare time. Um, uh, yeah, I think it varies. Like, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's t- you know, certain things, I think over time, you get a feel for how long certain stuff's going to take, um, both as yourself and as like a commissioning editor. So I always used to find that I'd say, you know, I could work it into like, Here's what needs to be done words wise. You know, this is the amount of time that can be spared. You know when someone's kind of taking the piss, or you know when you're you yourself are taking the piss. Um yeah, it's it's tricky. It is a tricky one. And it's like there there is no like fit right or wrong answer. Like I am a freelancer now, so I basically just have, you know, mm. I, I judge that for myself. Um it's like when you're comfortable. Um I'm a little bit of a I try to play the things to completion. So and I understand that being picky about that, I have to play things in my own time. Um also I used to I don't know, I didn't really see it as like work because if there was stuff I wanted to play anyway. It I depends, just, I, doesn't it? Like, like, like that's the sort of mentality of this job. Like if this was a job where you were like Oh, playing games is work. 
I don't know why you'd actively pursue it as a career because you'll never be able to do it really or excel at it. <laughs> like if, if with that mindset, yeah. But if you're, it's like, oh, I want to do that. Like I want to review this game, and but I know that being able to review it means I've got to play it, and you know I have X amount of time to do it in to hit the embargo. And I don't want to like show myself up as being, you know, I don't want to put out a review of something which I'm not sure about. It, it, um, like, like that, that's a fair point. You know, if you, like I reviewed Red Dead Redemption 2 and there wasn't an awful lot of time to review a, a, a mm. 6,000 hour video game. Uh, I almost killed myself to do it. But there, and I'm not saying that's right. At all, of course it's not. Uh, But at the same time, like when Code for Red Dead Redemption 2 came in, you know, I was looking forward to playing it that evening because Mm. I I love the first Red Dead Redemption. So I was really excited to see what this was. Like it varies. If the game you're playing is shite, then of course you're like eh, playing any of us in your free time is going to be a bit more of a chore. Um, yeah, I actually found that like after years of doing this job, it has broken me, like how I feel about playing games in my own time. Like for years, basically everything I played had work connected to it. Like I was yeah. always playing something for work, either review or you're playing something because you were going to be writing about the sequel and you just needed to kind of catch up on it or sort of fill in a knowledge gap. And now actually when I have all the time in the world, and I look at all the games available to me, I almost feel like without, <laughs> you know, that kind of, like, the, the, the objective of work, I mean, it sounds terrible, <laughs> that I can't decide what to play or I can't motivate myself, you know, I'd rather, you know, read or something. Like, actually, left to my own devices, my gaming habits are very different to my gaming work habits. Um, no, I, I, I completely agree. I very rarely, if ever play a game and for it not to be connected in some way to work. Yeah. Because and like, that's, <laughs> I know it's, it's, it's wrong. Yeah, it's it's wrong. I know, like, but I still, I know I play games daily yeah, yeah. for a large chunk of time because there is so much to play for work, but on the rare times where like, I've not got anything on, I am a little bit like, uh, I, I've forgotten how to do this by myself. How do you play <laughs> something for fun? Yes. Yeah. What yeah. is fun? <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for that question, Matt. Luke asked, what's one really good and one really bad idea for an IP uh, to have a spin-off in an un- entirely different genre, like what happened with Halo Wars? Well, you see, I said Halo Wars was bad in a video and loads of people shat on it, and they shat on me in the comments. So... Uh, <laughs> I've got to be. Um, uh, what's one really good and one really bad? Um, I'm like, I'm sure this has come up before on the weak spot. Like, I, I am a big believer in like real time tactics games mm. or like turn based strategy games as a means of of doing stuff where you have a team of characters. Like when that they hinted that there was going to be like some Marvel XCOM. For example, there was that rumor before E3 mm-hmm. um, and that on paper, I'm like, that's a great way to do the Avengers. You know, if, if there is a game where the appeal is controlling an ensemble cast, I'm a big, big fan of matching it to like a, some kind of strategy or tactics game like that. that mm-hmm. That's I will like Gears. Like well, I thought Gears, I thought Gears Tactics was absolutely amazing. Mm-hmm. I, I love that game. Um, yeah, but that, that kind of stuff. So, like, you could take anything, you know, I, I've said it before, like, I really want them to do Mission Impossible. I really want there to be a Mission Impossible um, game by, like, the Desperados guys, for example. I think that would be amazing. With You're controlling everyone at the same time to do heists and stuff. Um, but I guess that's a film IP rather than a... Rather than... Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, I think he's asking, like, what is... I think I think what Luke is asking is like what pre-existing spin-offs now are good. 
and bad. Oh, right. Okay. I, sorry. I, th- I thought I think, about the general concept. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I think, well, like, you know, you've given yours, Gears Tactics, I suppose. Um, I thought Persona 5 Strikers was really good. I really liked it. Or, I yeah. mean, you could, say, you could say Persona. It feels like, uh, as a, as a series, it has kind of usurped the uh, the original in Shin Megami Tensei. I mean, you you have plenty of examples in that in TV as well. Um, you brought up Cheers earlier, Frasier. Although it's maybe debatable whether <laughs> Frasier kind of usurped Cheers, I suppose. Um, but a bad but a bad IP spinner. I mean, I, I, like. It's not really PC. I'm not a big fan of the old Let's Stick Mario and a load of Kart sports games. Racing. No, right. I like Mario Kart, but like Mar- like Mario Football, that was that that sucked. I hate Mario Party. Um but that's got really nothing Mario to Golf? do. Mario Golf. Yeah. Not for a long time. It hasn't been good for a long time. Um fair, fair. Uh, I really like that. yeah, I guess we, same with the strikers. I, I really like the the X, you know, Warriors game meets, mm. you know, Zelda or Warriors meets this, that or the other. I think that's, that's always really good fun. Um, yeah. I don't know. More stuff though. I like it. When, I like it when people do weird. It's a weird thing. Uh, yeah. You couldn't really imagine. Um, Give us more weird things. Hopefully mm. that chaos filled Final Fantasy spinoff will be all right. Uh, Ryan. Got in touch. Ryan said, Matthew, between Mystery Steam Reviews and Cavern of Light, you spend a lot of time solving video game mysteries. If you were to start a Scooby-Doo like video game mystery solving crew, who else would you want on your team? And what pet would be your mascot? Hmm. Um, Sherlock what? Holmes. Herlock what? Sholmes. <laughs> yeah, Herlock Sholmes. Um, Ace Attorney, obviously. Uh, for, like legal problems. What's his name from Judgment? I can't remember. Is it just all the detectives? Just <laughs> yeah. all the video game uh, detectives? Yeah, I mean the good thing is there are so many different detect. There's like the fighting detective from Judgment. You've got your kind of classic sleuth, Professor Layton. You've got your if things should go to trial, uh, Phoenix Wright. I mean, you really cover all the basics. We've got like the law and order kind of split there. Um, in terms of a pet. Probably the cats that cook the food in Monster Hunter. Ooh. Not yeah. for their crime solving, just because the food looks absolutely delicious. Uh, Catherine's been playing that Monster Hunter Rise on Switch, which I think is coming to PC at next, some point. Next year, yeah. And it's, um, they eat these like, I don't know if they're not like, they look like sort of dumplings or something, but they look so tasty, um, even though they would be covered in cat fur. Which so they sp- the rank. pet is neither for their crime solving capabilities nor for them just being a pet. It's so you can work them in the kitchen. Make us feed this traveling band of detectives. Well, yeah. <laughs> and we'll be nice to we'll stroke them and stuff and Oh uh, yeah, you'll be nice to them. They're, you know, what does Scooby do? You know, it's not as like Scooby Doo's got like a, a much better deal. I don't think Shaggy's there whipping him from behind going, make us dinner, Scoob. Uh, the Scooby-Doo, is it implied that he makes the, the sandwiches? Uh, the, um, Doesn't he know. eat like big long sandwiches? And he's like... Blah, 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 blah. Is that Scooby-Doo? I mean, he what, eats, what Scooby, Scoo- what, he eats what? Scooby snacks. Yeah, are those just biscuits? They're just like crisps. Like, oh, of- listen, I'm not saying that... I don't think it's a legit reading of Scooby-Doo to say he's a chef. <laughs> Like that is not in, that is not implied by anything in the law, but <laughs> uh, and let's clear this docket. Uh, Jonathan said, as we all know, Rocket League equals football plus cars. Uh, what other sport or activity would you like to see improved by the substitution of humans for rocket cars? P.S. This question comes all the way from Birmingham, home of Black Sabbath and Cadbury's chocolate. Thank you very much, Jonathan. More local facts, please. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, which do what, you prefer, Black Sabbath or Cadbury's chocolate? Uh, Cadbury's chocolate. Oh, Cadbury's chocolate beats almost everything. I would say Black Sabbath could be the name of a chocolate. Um, like a dark chocolate, a really dark. Yeah, yeah, really Cadbury, dark. They should do. They should. They should do a team up. Um, <laughs> that'd be good. Uh, yeah, a sport that's improved by getting rid of the humans and sticking in rocket cars. Not in a video game, just in real life. All of them uh, curling. Curling. 
curling or uh, chess. Chess would be good, chess. actually. How? <laughs> that would be t- just two cars. Just two two just- cars just yeah, revving their engines sat across from each other. And they hit the clock and then the other one revs for five minutes. Um, hmm. I mean, the long like, jump? It, it basically turns... If you stick cars into most sports, it just turns them into, like, destruction derby. Destruction derby just stuff, yeah. Smashing into each other. Like, the pole vault. The, the shot put. But, like, I suppose, yeah, if, if, if the diving. car... Oh, that'd be good. Driving a car off something really tall and just landing it in a pool. That would be awesome to watch. I mean, they wouldn't even have to do like flips in the air. It would just be good just seeing the car. Yeah, I just, just, just want to see like if they land it in the pool, like how much water they displace, like what happens. Yeah. Like different cars, like what happens if it's a milk float? What happens if it's like an articulated lorry? <laughs> I, would, I would legit, that's the only thing that would get me watching the Olympics is if they had... Cars in place Cars of every in diving balls. Uh, so thank you very much for your question, Jonathan. Thank you very much to everyone. We said we'd do it eventually. We have. That is all the burning questions cleared. Uh, we put the fire out. We did indeed. The so, screaming man will be pleased. Uh, <laughs> so that does mean you need to uh, fire up the fire thing send us more questions please uh burn that man uh by emailing us uh weekspot at rockpapershotgun.com then we'll read them out on next week's show thank you very much wow yeah indeed (laughs) Uh, but if you want to find us in other ways and uh consume the week spot in other ways as well there are ways to do that. You can follow us on social media. I am at column underscore Ahern. Matthew is at Mr. Basil underscore Pesto. If you want to talk to some like-minded people, head over to Discord, discord.gg forward slash rock, paper, shotgun. Uh, if you want the video version of the week spot, head over to youtube.com forward slash rock, paper, shot. If you want the audio version, subscribe to the PC Gaming Week Spot podcast. Uh, we're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, etc., etc. But for all of your PC gaming needs, keep it on rockpapershotgun.com. That's it, Matthew. Another week spot in the bag, and it'll be interesting to find out what I'm gonna, what games I'm gonna be talking about next week in show and tell, because not a lot out. That Dungeons and Dragons thing, sure. Whatever. We'll find something. We always we'll, do. We'll figure out. And hopefully, I don't know, maybe Todd Howard will say something else about Starfield. We will see. Uh, but now it is time for my least favourite part of the show. Or we get the Elden Ring correspondent to talk more about that game. Uh, now it is time to bid the listener, the viewer, adieu. So say goodbye, Matthew Castle. Goodbye. And say goodbye, Colin Mahern, Sloan, Guffold.